There's a pretty reasonable case to be made that rapamycin could be quite beneficial for people who are suffering from this condition. By the end of the 10 weeks, the pain was pretty much completely gone and I had 95% or so range of motion back in my arm. My name is Matt Caberline and welcome to the OptusBand YouTube channel. Hey everyone, welcome to the R-Files, episode two. So this is where we talk about everything rapamycin related. And so in our first episode, um, we talked about how I got interested in rapamycin. This was back 2003, 2004. And then today we're gonna sort of fast forward 15, 16 years and I will tell you about my first exper experience personally taking rapamycin. So I've been, you know, relatively public with the fact that I have taken rapamycin off-label in the past and um, continue to cycle rapamycin periodically. So what I thought I'd do today is give a little bit of a deeper dive into the circumstances that really led to me making the choice the first time to take rapamycin off label. And so, you know, this is now 2020 or so. And um, by that point, I'd been studying rapamycin in the research context for going on 15 years or so. Obviously, I knew all about the various benefits on lifespan and health span metrics and a bunch of different laboratory organisms. Um, some of that work was done in my laboratory. But I would say up until that point, I was really pretty dismissive about off-label use of rapamycin and honestly, biohacking in general. And I don't mean that I was negative about it, but I just really hadn't paid that much attention to it and certainly hadn't really thought about using rapamycin myself. And in fact, I, I mean, looking back, I can say I was probably pretty dismissive of my own health. Um, I think like, like a lot of scientists, we know what to do, but we don't often actually do it. And so the story I'm going to tell you today, I think is um, in many ways, really the beginning of my own evolution to take control of my personal health span trajectory and in many ways really set the stage for OptiSpan and what we're doing now, trying to help as many people as possible to do the same thing. So again, this all start, started for me really in 2019, and it began with uh, sort of an annoying pain in my right shoulder. So uh, I think the first time I really remember noticing it was during softball season. And then going from 2019 into 2020, it really started to impact my ability to work out. So I like to lift weights. I've done that for many years. And I noticed that every time I did an exercise that involved a, a pressing motion, um, that I have a lot of pain in this shoulder. And it was kind of a weird pain. I mean, like I think like most people who've been active for many years, I'd had my share of injuries, but I never really had a pain where it was intensely painful right at first. And then by the fourth, fifth, sixth rep of an exercise, the pain kind of gradually went away. So I knew it wasn't a normal strain or muscle tear, but I really didn't have any idea what was causing it. And I think like, like a lot of guys, uh, I tried to ignore it for as long as I could. So I tried to, you know, muscle through the pain or do different exercises, but it just gradually kept getting worse and worse. And it got to the point where I couldn't sleep. I really struggled, you know, in just sort of daily activities. And even then, um, again, looking back, it's kind of ridiculous what a lot of guys will go through to avoid going to see the doctor. Even then, I didn't do anything about it until one day it was probably March or April of 2020. And if any of you are, you know, have ever lived in the Pacific Northwest, you'll know, you know, February, March, we've had weeks of gray, you haven't seen the sun. And then these absolutely gorgeous Pacific Northwest early spring days happen where you just physically have to get outside. And so it was one of those days, my son, son and I went across the street, we have a park across the street from our house, and we were just going to throw a football. And I, the very first time I tried to make that sort of, you know, throwing motion, I just couldn't do it. Um, it was so painful. And I had to tell him, I'm like, I'm really sorry, I just can't can't do it. It hurts too much. Uh, and that for me was the moment when I was like, okay, I'm done. I've got to get this taken care of. It was really honestly first time in my life that I really physically felt old. And so that was the impetus for me to actually take action. And so I, you know, I had an upcoming uh, appointment with my primary care doc in a few weeks anyways. So I went to that and, you know, I told him sort of what I just went through here that I'd had this pain in my shoulder. It was gradually getting getting worse. I'd convinced myself it was a torn rotator cuff. And I'm like, look, I've 
pretty sure I have a torn rotator cuff. I want to go see a specialist. I want to have surgery because I want to get this fixed because it sucks. And, uh, you know, he was like, no, no, no. I want you to go to physical therapy first. And, and I tried to push back, didn't succeed. And so um, I went to physical therapy. Uh, the next week I was fortunate I could get in quickly. Try, I really did try to give it a go for a few weeks and it just seemed like it was making the pain worse, not better. Um, so I went back to my primary care doc in early July and I'm like, you know what? I tried it your way. <laughs> That's not working for me. I want a referral to a specialist so I can go get this fixed. I need surgery. I want my shoulder fixed. So he, he gave in. Uh, I got the referral. I w took the first appointment I could get and I was actually pretty lucky. I was able to get in with a in a few weeks. And um, so I go see the specialist and with literally within 10 minutes, He's like, you don't have a torn rotator cuff. You have adhesive capsulitis, which I'd never heard of before. And so I was like, what's adhesive capsulitis? And he's like, well, it's commonly referred to as frozen shoulder and it's inflammation of the shoulder capsule. He's like, you know, it's not uncommon in people in their 40s and 50s that that you'll develop this condition. Um, you know, it can be very, very painful. And, uh, you know, there's not a lot that we can do to treat it. He's like, I could give you an injection of corticosteroids into the joint. I really don't like to do that because that can lead to loss of cartilage and other problems down the road. So my advice is that you go back to physical therapy and you know, for most people it'll go away in about a year. And I, I couldn't believe it actually that he said, you know what, just, it'll be okay. It might go away in a year. Um, so I left that appointment like honestly pissed off and depressed. And I thinking to myself, I cannot do this for another year. And so, you know, I, I was driving home sort of ruminating on this and it occurred to me, you know, I've been studying this drug, rapamycin. One of the things we know about rapamycin is it's extremely potent at knocking down age-related inflammation. And that's exactly what adhesive capsulitis is. It's age-related inflammation specifically of the shoulder capsule. And so I, you know, thought it's possible rapamycin might actually work to knock down that inflammation, alleviate the pain, and get me back to something closer to normal function. So, you know, I decided at that point that I would give it a try, that I'd develop a sort of N of one experiment and see whether or not rapamycin could have any impact on my frozen shoulder. So I sort of thought through, you know, what would that look like? I settled on six milligrams once a week for 10 weeks. Um, why six milligrams? Uh, uh, the reason was that was sort of what was common at that point, and it still is. I think there are a couple of reasons why six milligrams is kind of what the, the rapamycin off-label community has gravitated towards. We'll get more into that in the next episode. We'll talk actually about a paper we published last year where we collected data from 333 people who've been using rapamycin off-label. But suffice it to say that at that time and still, six milligrams once a week was the most common dose that, that people are using. And then I decided to go for with, with 10 weeks because um, we knew from studies that I had done in dogs, in companion dogs, that that was enough to see improvements in age-related heart function and activity. And then looking at the mouse studies, where there were quite a few studies by that point, between six and 12 weeks is enough to improve function and particularly reduce inflammation in uh, the oral cavity. So for periodontal disease, um, that was work that Jonathan Ahn had done in my lab. Uh, and I'll just uh, point out that you may want to watch for the episode uh, where I sat down with John and we talked about the work he's doing now with rapamycin and periodontal disease. So I knew from that that in mice, eight weeks was long enough to see a knockdown of inflammation in the gums and the bone in the, in the oral cavity. Um, and then other people had shown six weeks and eight weeks in mice was enough to see restoration of immune function or restoration of heart function. So 10 weeks just kind of felt like, you know, about the right length of time uh, to see whether anything happened. So, you know, I, I figured this out. I kind of wrote down what I was going to do and I thought I'll start and then, you know, I'll go for 10 weeks and then see where I'm at. And so, uh, so I started this protocol and within three weeks, I really felt like there was a noticeable decrease in pain. Um, and then by the end of the 10 weeks, 
I would say the pain was pretty much completely gone and I had 95% or so range of motion back in my arm. And look, I'm a scientist. I recognize placebo effect is real. I can't rule out that this wasn't something like placebo effect, but if for any of you have ever had frozen shoulder, you will probably agree with this. It is just such an intense pain that it it is difficult for me to believe that this was all placebo effect. And the it's a biologically plausible mechanism, in my mind at least, that rapamycin would knock down the inflammation that I'm pretty confident that this was a real effect of the rapamycin. Uh, fortunately, the pain has not come back in the several years since then. And so um, I think that, you know, for me personally, this experience had a huge impact on my quality of life. And, you know, obviously I'm not recommending if you have frozen shoulder that you go out and start taking rapamycin. Certainly I would suggest if you choose to do that, that you do it under the care of a physician. But I would like to see more studies here to actually show, you know, how often is this the case? You know, is it, is it, is it, a, a low percentage of people who actually would benefit like I did, or is it a high percentage of people? I think there's a pretty reasonable case to be made that rapamycin could be quite beneficial for people who are suffering from this condition. So since then, I've cycled rapamycin. You know, again, for a scientist, I'm I'm pretty non-scientific in my approach here, but I've used this cycling strategy of cycling rapamycin for 10 to 12 weeks on, and then you know anywhere from six to nine months off. Um, I'm actually currently right now in week four of a 12-week cycle. I'm doing eight milligrams per week. This time I've gone six all the way up to 10. Um, I've had no noticeable side effects in that first cycle or in any of my other cycles until about a week ago. And so you'll have to tune in for the upcoming episode where I talk about that. Um, but by and large, you know, I would say uh, I have really noticed nothing that, that concerns me in terms of side effects from rapamycin. And um, I can't really ascribe any confidence to significant benefits from rapamycin other than this experience I just mentioned where my frozen shoulder was basically cured. Um, and then it's my perception that I have a noticeable decrease in pain in my wrist and elbows and when I'm lifting weights. And honestly, that's kind of when I decide that it's time for another cycle. When I start to feel the the chronic pain, inflammation in my wrists and elbows when I'm, I'm doing my workouts, I'm like, oh, probably about time to do another cycle of rapamycin. So that certainly could be more of a psychosomatic effect or placebo-like effect. Again, I can't rule that out. And honestly, I don't care. If it works for me, that's great. But again, given the mechanism of action of rapamycin, it seems pretty plausible to me that that could be a real effect of rapamycin. And you know, I've talked to enough people who have commented on similar experiences that they've had that I think it's, it's certainly possible that some of these you know, uh, aches and pains that go along with aging driven by chronic inflammation could actually be improved from this sort of short course of rapamycin treatment. The other thing I'll say is we know from the studies in laboratory animals, these, these six to 12 week studies that rapamycin again is very potent at knocking down inflammatory markers and it takes a while for those markers to come back up. And so that's sort of the rationale behind this cycling approach that I do. Again, the expectation would be if there are any significant side effects from rapamycin, you're less likely to experience side effects doing a eight to 12 week course followed by six months off than you are continuously dosing rapamycin. But you know, there are lots of people who do continuous use of rapamycin off label. Um, and so again, this is just sort of what I've settled on for myself. Um, okay, so that is my story, my first time with rapamycin. Uh, next time, as I mentioned on the R files, we'll do a deeper dive into that study we published last year, collecting data from people using rapamycin off label. And as I mentioned, uh, keep an eye out for my interview with Dr. Jonathan Ahn. Uh, we talked a lot about his work on periodontal disease and aging and how rapamycin impacts oral health. And the clinical trial that he is doing now to test whether or not rapamycin can positively impact periodontal disease in people. So uh, I hope that you found this episode interesting and enjoyable, and uh, we'll see you next time on The R-Files.